Welcome to a new video. Let's take a look at some new malicious compliance stories. The first story is called, Raise Freeze Expect in Case of Promotions. Many years ago I managed a store at a fairly large corporate book chain. While other book chains were going out of business, ours was thriving. We rented our store locations instead of purchasing them, so we were able to shut down underperforming stores quickly and since the economy was bad, corporate was able to procure low rents when opening new locations or negotiating new contracts for existing spaces. But while the company itself was booming, a raise freeze was in effect at stores and had been for about two years. It was pretty demoralizing to know that no matter how hard you worked, you wouldn't be able to receive a raise. But when I got promoted from assistant manager to store manager, I realized that raise freezes were only in effect for people who stayed in the same position. If you got a new position, you could get a raise since you were moving up the food chain and taking on more responsibilities. In addition to management positions, we also had specialist positions available. There was a merchandising specialist, who changed the discount stickers every week and set out bestsellers and new arrival sections. Magazine and sale book specialists put out the new merchandise in both sections. And finally, we had a specialist in charge of putting all the non-book merchandise out and making sure they were properly discounted once a week. These were things like reading lights, pens, keychains, toys, etc. Once my promotion went into effect, I hatched my plan. I spoke with all my employees and explained that I had found a loophole in the system and that I was willing to give them a temporary promotion if they wanted, so that they could get a raise. They could pick one of the positions to learn, and they would be promoted to a specialist and get a raise. Then, once the raises went through in a few weeks, they would be stepped back down to a cashier position but keep their raise. This was possible and all on the up and up according to corporate policy because it wasn't technically a management position. Then we'd rotate someone else in and repeat the process. In the end, the people who were originally the specialists would regain their original positions and would also get a raise. We had a small staff of around 20 including my management team, and not all employees wanted to participate. Some only worked a shift or two a week, and one full-time cashier wasn't interested in learning anything else because then people might expect more out of him. But the rest were fully on board. I rotated it pretty carefully so my district manager didn't have to rubber stamp three positions at a time. And within four months, all employees who had participated in my plot had received the maximum allowable raise. As a bonus, we now had at least three people trained in each position. Some of my specialists had lots of vacation time socked away that they never used, because they knew their sections would be a mess if they were gone for very long. Now they were able to take their vacation time or call out sick, knowing they had a backup. And the newly cross-trained cashiers enjoyed getting a break from the register sometimes to work on projects. In fact, because they knew the store much better, it made them better at upselling. If they noticed a customer was getting a book by a popular author, for instance, they would show them other books by that author in the bargain book section. And soon we saw a strong improvement in sales overall. It's almost like happy employees do a great job. What a shocker. The next story is called, I can't afford that. In my area, people who would like to become active in local politics usually start by making their names visible in the community. One way to do that is to get tapped as a board member for a charity. The owner of the company where I worked had aspirations to become a political figure. He volunteered as chairman of a charity fundraiser. This was the type of fundraiser where you convinced people to donate a portion of their paycheck each month, which was taken out as a deduction at payroll time. If a chairman was successful at this fundraiser, he would very likely be nominated for the charity board. The charity suggested that a chairman should have at least 97% compliance at their own company as an example. So every employee was pressured hard to contribute. Bonnie was a long-time employee. She wasn't smart in many ways. She couldn't handle an Excel spreadsheet. She had trouble adding a column of numbers. But she was excellent at customer relations. She always remembered names, had a sweet and helpful disposition and was a ninja at calendars and appointments. She was our front desk receptionist. The customers loved her and always remembered her name. Because of her deficiencies, she was never promoted off the front desk and she never got a raise. When the charity campaign happened, Bonnie was adamant that she couldn't afford to give away any of her money. As the campaign participation rate climbed closer and closer to that magic 97%, the pressure on the employees got more and more intense. Finally, it came down to the point where each individual holdout was getting a one-on-one -on -one education about how helpful the charity was. Bonnie got her one-on-one -on -one with the owner himself. She didn't budge. She just kept saying over and over that she couldn't afford it. Because she was so bad at math, the owner decided that she simply needed to learn how to budget better. He volunteered to show her how. She happily agreed. So one day, Bonnie brought in all her monthly bills and bank statements. 
The owner took her into a conference room and helped her work on her budget. The other employees, me included, watched with great interest. After about three to four hours, the owner came out of the conference room, dazed and shell-shocked. Bonnie gathered all her papers and retreated to the break room for a coffee break. Of course, all the employees needed a coffee break, too. Bonnie, being the happy and talkative person she was, had no problem talking about what happened. Turns out that Bonnie had a very well-constructed budget and managed her money wisely. She didn't have room for any extras, though, because she hadn't gotten a raise in so long. But now, everything was great. The owner worked over her budget, couldn't find any room, so he decided she needed a raise. Bonnie told him that was wonderful because now she could afford to add HBO and other extras to her cable package. The owner tried to explain that wasn't what the raise was for, but Bonnie asked if he had HBO. He had to admit that he did. So if he had HBO, why would she need to sacrifice her HBO for his charity deduction? The owner caved and agreed that she deserved HBO if she wanted. He added another raise. She was delighted because now she could get that other thing she'd never been able to afford. He tried to explain that the raise was for the charity deduction. But once again she asked if he had that other thing and if he didn't need to give it up for the charity deduction, why should she? In the end, she got quite a large raise. Everything she'd always wanted she could now afford, plus enough left over to contribute to the charity drive. So, she complied with the request to contribute. Now the company was at 100%. But Bonnie explained, that was okay. The charity drive was only for a year. The raise was permanent. So, that was almost like a guaranteed raise next year, wasn't it? The next story is called, Don't Want to Tell Me What's Going On? There are two things I must explain before we continue. I work as a paramedic in a fairly busy emergency medical service system. I almost always will take the time out of my day to solve issues that do not need medical transport, like calling a patient's doctor to set up an appointment for them, calling them to get refills, etc. This way people don't get hit with a bill that they don't need to get hit by because insurance does not even touch a transport that wasn't medically needed. And there are generally two types of older people I deal with, sweet old grannies, and people who probably are kept alive by dark magics. This is the story of the second type of old person and the just deserts they got. My partner and I were dispatched to a house at around noon. And we were less than infused. This person had called 10 times today, and 9 of those calls were ended when the paramedic called for non-transport orders. This means they called the doctor and said, can we not bring this person to the emergency room? I found this to be strange, as it's a complete pain to get those orders, and in basically all cases, we don't get them. We arrived at the home and knocked on the door. This bad of a woman answered the door. It's about damn time you got here. I need to go to the hospital, right now. Okay, I'll be glad to do that. But could you give me a little information about what is going on? It's none of your business. Now, take me to the emergency room. I now am fully aware of why my comrades had simply said, no, and left. The woman is awake, talking, and speaking, appropriately. So she meets the rough criteria to make decisions for herself. I decided to keep digging. Well, I need an actual reason to go there with you. Could you tell me just a bit about what's wrong? How about no? It's my business and I'm not sharing it with some two-bit ambulance driver. At this point no doctor would deny me, no transport orders and my partner is silently screaming for us to just leave. But I had enough of her and just complied. Okay, well then get on the cot, we'll take you to the emergency room. Can we take a set of vitals? Don't you touch me with that damn machine, you're giving me a ride and nothing else. Okay, you're within your rights to refuse anything. But I need your name and date of birth for paperwork or we're going to call for non-transport orders, and you're going to stay here. Fine, my name is this and my date of birth is this. Now shut up and leave me alone. Okay, can do. The trip is completely uneventful from there. I call the hospital to let them know to expect a patient, and my favorite nurse answered the phone. Emergency room, this is the nice nurse, what are you bringing? An old female, refuses to share complaint, no vitals. What? Me, an old female, refuses to share her complaint, no vitals, as she will not let us take them. We are five minutes out. Okay, see you guys when you get here. We arrive at the emergency room and the woman begins her complaints. I will not chronicle them here, as quite frankly I don't remember all of it. Walking into the emergency room, the nursing staff begin their usual questions, and I see the nice nurse. So, what did you bring? An old female who is hemodynamically stable, and will not share her complaint. She can go out to triage, we're busy here. They were indeed busy, I knew this for a fact because I had already brought them five patients, two of which were in an extremely critical state. The bat woman realizes that she isn't going to get to skip the line, and proceeds to lose her mind. Why are we out here? 
I need a doctor, right now. If you needed a doctor, you should have told me what was wrong, as I am the one who tells the hospital just how badly sick or injured you are. But you didn't, because I'm a 2-bit ambulance driver. Bring me to a bed right now or I'll sue you all. It's too late, talk to these nurses and they'll get you back as soon as they can. I went about my day from there and didn't really think too much of it. We brought another patient to that emergency room and I just had to know what was so pressing that that woman wouldn't tell anyone. So I asked the nice nurse what had happened. She refused to tell any of us what she needed. So she waited in the waiting room for 7 hours before we finally got a bed open for a person without a complaint. That's a long time. So what did she end up needing? A refill of her blood pressure medication. What? Turns out she wasn't out, she just was running low. What? That's literally what she wanted. I'm going home. The real compliance comes in now though because she just got her bills from this escapade. Because she didn't need to go to the hospital by ambulance, her insurance isn't going to pay a dime towards the bill. It costs $1,500 for us to put you in the ambulance and put that thing in drive. On top of this, she's going to get a bill from the emergency for around $5,000. If she needed an ambulance, her insurance would have covered 90% of that ambulance bill, and we would write off the other 10%, and they would have covered 100% of that emergency room bill. And before you ask, no she doesn't have dementia, or Alzheimer's, or any other disease like that. She was literally just a bad old lady that I would have gladly just called her doctor and gotten her a refill, but she didn't want me to do that, because I'm just an ambulance driver. The last story is called, The First Day on the Job. I work at a casino. I'm the technician that handles all the surveillance cameras. Originally I worked in the casino warehouse but was hired to be the tech after a glowing recommendation from my former boss. I'll preface this with the fact that I had no IT or mechanical experience professionally when hired to this position. I was told many times during the interview and orientation that I didn't need any experience and that I would be trained by our other tech. This story begins on my ride to my first day on the new job. The previously mentioned tech, we'll call him Walter and I actually live close together, so we began carpooling. During the ride, Walter who is really a nice guy but this story might make him seem like a jerk, began telling me that there were some orders I would be given by our boss, that he doesn't feel is part of his job that he refuses to do and that basically, he'll be mad at me if I try doing them for him. I tell him that since I'm so new, I'll have to follow expectations because I don't want to cause waves. This sets Walter off, berating me with all sorts of nonsense like, how are you going to say you have pride in your job if you do things that aren't your job? He basically called out my pride. My pride doesn't come from the things I do while I work for pennies to pay for some rich guy to have a fourth Porsche and a ninth mansion, so whatever, I shrugged it off. Now when we get to work, our job is to install new cameras in the bar which is going through a complete renovation. In order to do this, we had to integrate these new cameras into our very dated, very disorganized camera network that only Walter knows how to work with. All the former techs left the department in disarray. After working with a hub that acts as a landing point for our new inputs, he began getting frustrated, swearing and throwing his tools. I begin to distance myself. I go to the bathroom and come back. He is then very angry and begins accusing me of doing the things my boss tells us to do that apparently isn't our job. Walter goes to our boss's office, we'll call him Todd, and tells him none of this is his job and leaves for the day abruptly. I come to the office a few minutes later and Todd tells me that since he left, it's now my responsibility to integrate the new inputs. I explain to him that the error can only be solved by entering lines of code I know nothing of and that tech support won't be back until the following Monday. This happened on a Friday. Todd says, well it's broken now. You couldn't mess it up any further than it is. Go do it, I don't have time for this, I need to go home. Make sure it's done by tonight because our executive committee will be inspecting the bar. I explain that this issue is a network issue and potentially could take down cameras that are necessary for state compliance. I told him the only other thing I heard was that the code that tech support had given us kept doing something weird with the cameras we needed for compliance and that Walter knew how to bring them back online and I did not. He doesn't care and leaves, but not before telling me to just run the code. By this time, I'm at about 10 hours logged on this shift. My ride home is gone and I'm starting to get a little mad. I decided to comply, with malicious intent. I read for another two more hours about how to even look at the settings for this hub. I plug a laptop into it and open up PuTTY. I was able to figure out through trial and error how to enter commands. Before I enter the lines of code, I ask my boss via phone call one more time if this is a good idea. He tells me not to call him at home unless it's an emergency and reiterates his prior command. So I start entering the code and suddenly I see all of our cameras start dropping off one by one. I start getting calls from the surveillance observers, wondering what was going on. I told them that I was following the instructions that Todd gave me. 
They were all very mad and began calling Todd, our directors, and after nobody cared, they called gaming. They issue the command to shut down the casino until the problem is resolved. Eventually, Todd stops whatever he was doing and comes back to work just in time for the executives to show up. Todd scolds me and says that I can be the one to face the executives since it was my mistake. I was more than happy. The executives are all in a conference room along with two state gaming regulators and the actual CEO of the casino company. They ask for Todd, Todd sends me. I get into the room and everyone is demanding answers. Where's Todd? Why is this happening? Every minute a casino stays closed can potentially be thousands of dollars in lost revenue. So this is a really, really serious deal for these suits. They unrelentingly grill me and I have to take a second to clear my head before I respond or I might just start slapping people, the tension in that room was crushing. So I sit down, grab a bottle of water and explain to them what happened. And that it was my first day and the other tech just went someplace and nobody knows where he went. The CEO actually apologized and told me to go ahead and head home and that I wouldn't be blamed for anything. I took the bus home. The next day, the casino floor still being down, I pass Walter in the hall, who had just been transferred to another department. And then I go into the surveillance room where the observers showed me on video what had happened once the executives tracked down Todd. Apparently, one of the members found him hiding in an elevator service room. I got to watch him walk, shoulders slumped, into the conference room. I got to watch and hear them harshly call him out, his poor decisions and his poor leadership. I got to listen to them tell him how unfair and poor a decision it was to assign me to the task when he himself had the skills to complete it. One of our directors told him that he was no longer needed here. I watched the footage of him pack his things and have two security officers escort him off the property. It was great. I then worked with a flown in tech specialist who was very helpful and actually showed me quite a bit while we solved the issue together. Later, I found out the casino lost almost a million dollars in revenue over the evening between fines and the fact that this was a high roller event weekend gone wrong. I still love thinking about it 5 years later. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing to the channel for more content. Let me know what you think about the stories in the comment section below. Have a great day. Bye bye.